Welcome to the Wheeler Centre and this afternoon's discussion of Jessica Anderson's Tira Lira by the River. My name is Lily Wilkinson, I'm an author and academic and here with me today is Rosalie Hamm. Rosalie is a teacher of literature uh, and the author of The Dressmaker, Summer at Mount Hope and There Shall Be More Dancing. Please uh, join me in making her welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for coming out in this very unpleasantly mm -hmm. cold Melbourne winter night afternoon. Um, so, Rosalie, I want to start by just um, maybe you telling us about your first encounter with this book. I had to read it as part of a, a literary course that I was doing at RMIT. Mm -hmm. I had read it many years prior to that, but I revisited it then. Of course, when you revisit something and you're <laughs> reading it with a group of people and they're taking it apart piece by piece, of course, I realised there was so much more to it mm. by, by really analytical reading. And I just thought it was the most lovely book. Mm. I enjoyed it enormously. And then rereading again for today, I found more. Mm. Mm. And it, it had a profound effect on me. I enjoyed it immensely. Yeah, I think it definitely is one of those books that sort of the more you think about it, the better it gets. Yep. Yep. Um, mm. Yeah. So Jessica Anderson has said that she likes to write books about people who are strangers in their own societies. Mm. Um, do you think that this describes Nora? Absolutely. Um, and I like the, the parallel between Nora and Dorothy Rainbow. Yes. That was probably one of the most moving parts of the book for me. Mm. And I thought that she captured, she did the triangle in my mind between the Lady of Shalott mm -hmm. and Nora and Dorothy Rainbow, and none of them fitted. And I, de I don't think they, I, I'm not sure, but in my mind I don't think they ever would have fitted but it was sad to me that Nora came back and made that observation mm. that what would have what was suppressed the artist in her what would have come from that by living that life and not leaving mm. but somehow again if she'd stayed she would have still been isolated yeah. and a stranger in her own mm. society. Definitely. Um, I'm going to come back to, to Dorothy Rainbow a little bit later, but let's talk about The Lady of Shalott and the title of the book. Um, the Lady of Shalott, which I'm sure you all know, you know, is a poem uh, by Alfred Law Tennyson about a lady who was cursed to only ever see the world uh, reflected in a mirror um, and then translate what she sees into this tapestry that she is weaving. Um, how do you think that this reflects Nora's own experience? Well, there's the obvious parallels in the sewing mm -hmm. and the the tapestries. But I think Nora often tried to see life and the way things were from from a real perspective, but she, she couldn't in the same way she saw life. She kind of saw it through a mirror, mm -hmm. and she never quite got it clear in my mind until, of course, she flipped the globe mm -hmm. and had to confront it when she came back again. And I've forgotten what you asked me. Oh, what? the Lady of Shalott and, and oh, how. The, 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 yeah, the mirror, and you answered it. Um. I'm not sure. I, you, I'm not sure. I'm still trying to work this out. Because the Lady of Shalott left mm -hmm. and went outside to, to follow Lancelot singing Tira Lira. Mm. I'm not sure what that meant in relation to Nora. I don't think Nora does. I think that the Lady of Shalott sort of comes to this tragic end because she makes this decision to put aside her mirror. And I suppose Nora does as well. I don't think Nora's end is necessarily tragic, mm. but she does, you know, there is certainly an impression that she is coming to an end at the end of the book. Yes. Um, but it's certainly not that kind of wild tragedy of the cracking mirror. And no, of, she, choose, she doesn't think she'll sew again. Mm. But, mm. Um, but, yeah, I feel like the... In some ways, the Lady of Shalott is different because she makes this sort of very big choice to, mm. you know, to fight for love and to do all of this stuff, whereas Nora doesn't seem to do that. No, she's quite happy. What about the guy she had the affair with on the... On the ship to She London. was happy to let him go. Yeah. She, that was fine for yeah. her. Mm. And, and she says after that that afterwards she never sought out romance and never had any romantic feelings or experiences no. ever again, and that was a very deliberate decision mm. for her. And she, but the, the, the other thing, while we're on the subject of romance, that scene where she lies on the, on the river mm -hmm. and undoes her bodice mm. and exposes herself to nature and maybe that was an attempt mm. to find something. Yeah. But that still didn't. Yeah. 
it is it is interesting and then of course her sort of her adolescent experience with um the boys under the tree yeah and yeah. the boy and the the piano playing boy oh, whose name yes, i've forgotten was, which is yeah, obviously yeah. quite traumatic for her mm. um one of the things that I would recommend to students, and there are only a couple of students in the audience, um, but one of the things I would recommend in terms of the idea of the mirror and the reflection and reflecting and distorting the real um, is if you want a little bit of extra extension, go and have a look um, at the, the story of Plato's cave, which you can just Wikipedia. Uh, and I think there are some very interesting parallels about not experiencing life, but experiencing it as a reflection, which I think would be very interesting. Um, and I think that it is the poem is very much about the conflict between um, between art and life, yes, um, and making indeed. art and living life. Mm. Um, and in some ways, I wonder if Nora really does either. Maybe that's got to do with the mirror. Mm. Maybe the mirror is possibly the um, artistic way of seeing it, or the real way of seeing it, mm. and vice versa, depending on what emphasis you put on art mm. and what emphasis you put on life, mm. perhaps. Um, so definitely one of the one of the largest and sort of most resonant themes in the book is sort of this idea of landscape and of real landscape mm. overlaying fantasy landscapes and Nora talks a lot about looking through the the cheap glass of her window when she was a child and seeing this sort of romantic fantasy realm complete mm. with flashing lakes and you know tall towered castles uh, and she thinks that she she mentions that she feels like she was enchanted by this landscape and I think that she doesn't actually mean enchanted as in how enchanting, how lovely. She means that she was bewitched by it. Um, and that after a while she says that she didn't even need to look out the window because that landscape had sort of filled her mind. Do you think she ever leaves that fantasy landscape? No, I think she keeps trying to. And I think that she keeps adapting to the landscapes that she finds mm. but when she first moved to London and she kept moving around I think she was probably possibly searching for something there I don't think she ever really finds it because but when she does come back home she looks out the window and it's not there and that's when she understands that was in her mind mm. so maybe that says something about just making do with what you've got, which possibly was something to do with um, life at that time that she was writing about anyway, doing the best with what you've got. Yeah. But no, I think coming home for her, she realises a lot of things about what she imagined and what reality was. Mm. And I think probably what she imagined, she found out was what she imagined. It yeah. wasn't really there. Yeah. Um, I've got a quote from Jessica Anderson talking about the book and she says, I was writing about a woman who was actually born an artist but was in a place where artists were supposed to exist somewhere else. Mm. She was born among that kind of people and she herself doesn't know that she's an artist. She had a kind of buried talent, the sewing, the tapestries. Uh, they had to be something that was acceptable to her society. Um, and how do you think that Nora's story reflects the sort of changing experiences and expectations of women in the 20th century? It, it's, there's a lot of parallels with my... Uh, mother and my grandmothers mm -hmm. and they were very talented and very clever people too with their hands but they would there was no outlet for that that wasn't an accepted thing so they found that through sewing mm. and I think that's probably what Nora eventually did and there's a strange paradox in that because if she had stayed in that oppressive environment she may have become an artist mm. just through those brilliant tapestries but now of course you can be an artist you it's it's so acceptable and if she, if Nora was alive now there would be no problem and mm. I'm wondering even if she would even grapple with it and if you remove the grappling with that whether you actually become an artist or you just take it for granted that this is something I can do yeah so there's something else there about oppression and release in mm. some way but I I think in the end I don't what do you think do you think that Nora in the end understood that she was an artist yeah, I think so, because there is that moment where she revisits the tapestries where everybody brings yes. her, you know, the beautiful tapestries that she's made, that she made for them when yes. she was a teenager. And mm. she's she's incredibly surprised when she first hears that everyone has them. She sort of has this very kind of self-deprecating, oh, well, they'll all be terrible. Yes. Um, and then she's really shocked yes. that they're incredibly beautiful. And mm. I think that she's that that's probably a bit of a... And it had already begun, yeah. the whole process. And it's sad that it was lost when she went overseas yeah. and had to resort to earning a living. Mm. And making, yeah, functional clothes for people which were not artistic until she gets her job, perhaps, in the theatre. Yeah, uh, in where the theatre she, theater, she came more. into her own, didn't mm. she? There was a lovely... Um, 
reference there to the dressmaking, the uh, I remember it's coming back to me now where those women that came to her trying on dresses and wanting dresses sewed and saying, but is it really me? Mm. And trying to somehow accommodate the, the perception they had of themselves, what was real mm. and what they wanted to present to yep. the world. So there was all those sorts of things that I found this mm. time around as well. Yeah. What I found really interesting is that, you know, she talks so much about like looking through fashion magazines and sort of, and that that's a whole new fantasy landscape for her. Yeah. Um, and that the making of clothes and the sewing and the cutting and all of this is important. But I don't think once in the book, uh, certainly not after she gets married, is ever mentioned what she wears or how she dresses herself. No, we, we understand what she had on. I remember she described what she had on the night she met Colin yep. Porteous, but that's the yeah. the only time. Yeah, so she it's did. sort of like for her, fashion is re- it really is a means for creative expression and not actually something that she seems to in really be particularly interested in as its own. No, and prior to that. Before she went away, she was interested in in um, beauty mm. and literature and, and poetry. poetry. Mm. And it seems now that we're talking about it that, that release and that freedom mm. changed her yeah. and made her go in a direction where you, she had to survive so she did other things. Mm. Definitely. Sewing. Um, she mentions uh, somewhere towards the end of the book that she sees her life as vile wastage. <gasps> Yes. Do you agree? Look, you know, I, in my experience of reading the book is that um, impatience. I got so impatient with the wasting all those years with Colin Porteous mm. and all of that wandering over the landscape mm. and trying to find, seeking, not being happy. I got very, very frustrated with it. Yeah. Uh, but when I got to the end of the book when she'd the globe was a three-dimensional shiny on all sides, she confronted everything when I knew the facts about Dorothy Rainbow again and there was something else I was going to say which escapes me again and I've forgotten your question again (laughs) vile wastage oh that's right the vile wastage yeah it wasn't no it was the way you it it was sort of like fate Mm. it was the way her life was meant to be and that was the way it was and I thought she came to terms with that Mm. in the end and it was resolved for me by the fact of what happened to Dorothy Rainbow may have happened to Nora. Yeah, I wanted to... I've got Mm. a question about that later on but I'm going to find it and go to it now. Um, I think that, yeah, Dorothy Rainbow definitely is like a reflection of Nora. Yes. um, And that she's what would have happened if the Lady of Mm. Shalott hadn't had the loom and the tapestry, that Mm. if all she could do was sit and watch in the mirror Mm. uh, and she would probably would have gone crazy and attacked Lancelot with an axe. Yes. Um, That's a terrible thing to say. Um, But what is it that you think creates this impulse towards death for both of them? Because, you know, there is Nora's suicide attempt and Dorothy Rainbow's, you know, obviously incredibly horrific acts. Mm -hmm. What is this impulse towards death? Agoraphobia. I think it's frustration and waiting and dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. I just, for for my way of trying to come to terms with that, I just thought, oh, it's the artistic temperament Mm -hmm. and the the frustration. And the fact that they, it wasn't easily realised. That wasn't something you could own and do and exult at. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was a a real problem. Something that you would find very difficult to live with. Mm. Yes, I think that that's true. Mm. Um... One of the, the kind of scenes or passages and bits that, that kind of really fascinated me was when, uh, is when she goes and gets her plastic surgery, yeah. um, which seems bizarre to think of people doing that just mm. after World War II. Mm. Um, and I found that so fascinating because she uh, is clearly hiding and waiting. She spends most or really all of the book hiding and waiting. And she talks a lot about, you know, I, when I moved to London, I went into a new period of waiting. Um, and she's always sort of working in, within this sort of fantasy realm, whether it be in sort of the Camelot fantasy realm or within her um, fashion magazines, and she likes to escape. Um, and when she gets her plastic surgery, she's quite disappointed by the results. She thinks that, yes. you know, it obviously hasn't worked properly, but she seems to be sort of viciously delighted in the expressionlessness of her face. Mm. Um, which I found really, really interesting. What is it that you think she's hiding from? I don't know. A self. Mm. Or, um, 
whatever it is that she's seeking she says she loves beauty and as you say she appreciates fashion and all those sorts of things but she can't for some reason she can't absorb it and make it hers and live it mm. she eschews it all the time like she purposely said well, I'm never having another sexual encounter so that's something that I'm very confused about. I'm very confused about the facelift. I'm very mm. confused why she would choose to do that because she didn't come across to me as being a very vain mm. sort of person. She spoke about ageing and I'm the sort that it happens overnight. But I don't understand... What do you make of that? I don't understand why she had that facelift. It wasn't as if she was looking for a... Yeah, I think she is. I don't think she's vain, but I think she's incredibly self-critical. Like, uh, I think most of her most of her life has been her thinking that she's not good enough. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that even though she is initially incredibly physically attracted to Colin's brother at that dance, yes. when it's Colin there, she's like, oh, well, he'll do. Mm. And I think that that comes from, like, a deep place of insecurity mm. um, and her not really believing it enough in her own... Um, you know, her own artistic Ability. qualities yeah. and, you know, thinking that the tapestries are no good. And even, like, with her marriage, that she's clearly very unhappy, but she mm. has to wait until Colin asks for a divorce. Like, she would never... Wasn't that very... That was so very annoying. Do, what do you think about her sister as well, Grace oh, and her mother? Yeah, I think that they're very interesting. And, Grace, I love that moment when... Um, at the, towards the end of the book where um, I think it's Betty says about Grace for the whole of her life she tried to have faith and for the whole of her had life opinions. she only had opinions oh. um, which I love but then she kind of has this beautiful redemption at the end when she discovers compost the compost yeah um, but do you think I, I just got the feeling that um, it was Grace and her mother and that environment that she lived in mm. that that did keep her down. Yes. That did suppress all of that. Yeah, and definitely. I thought that Grace had a lot to answer for and mm. I couldn't understand why Grace always expected her to come back. Yeah. So it was like Grace and her mother didn't they didn't see what was in mm. her. Although the people around her seemed to know. Yeah. The late Mrs. Cust said or someone said, You we always thought that you would do something artistic. Mm. But it but it appears though nobody ever said that to her. Yeah. Nobody ever would have said that to my mother. Nobody ever said that to me. I was mm. born in 1955. All people ever said to me was, are you going to be a nurse or a teacher? Yeah, my mother's the same and she's a writer now as well. Mm. And yeah, it is very much that, um, you know, those expectations of women and, and particularly I think in working class families as well. Absolutely. And if nobody gives you a permission mm. and, and let you allows you that thought for yourself, then you don't... Mm do it yeah. and some people go have disastrous lives because of that yeah. or Nora yeah. being a case in point um, and I love also that she's not just drawn to um, to creativity but just to anything involving her brain that when Colin won't yes. let her get a job she sort of teaches herself French, French. and maths no. and all of these things that she's just so hungry for something to do But and she lives that double life going to Bomera mm. in the day and you know, looking, spending time with Ida Mayo and all those lovely people and then having to go home to him and his <laughs> mother. Yeah. I mean, what a way to live your life. I do. I think a lot about, I thought a lot about, about Colin and, you know, I think it's very easy to blame him and, you know, say that he's a terrible husband. Yeah. But I also suspect that because of her and her fantasy land that when she met him, she's like, well, he can be Lancelot. Yes. And that she, yeah. I don't know if she ever really sees him. And that I think that because of that, you know, she never should have agreed to marry him in the first place. I don't know why she did. All of a sudden she married him. And I didn't actually ever get a real good sense of Colin Porteous. No. I didn't. He wasn't a... Uh, I couldn't understand what their relationship was. Mm. Or I didn't, un I didn't really quite know how he felt about yeah. her that much. And I much. think that that is a, a sort of... It's a good... Um, Signal that Nora is not necessarily a reliable narrator. No, she's not a rel uh, no, and um, it has to do with her. But she's not even really reliable about herself. I found a few contradictions in there too mm. that I puzzled over, but I put it down to her artistic temperament. Yeah, she is very contradictory. Yeah, um, but I like that about her. Yeah, I, I like. I was fascinated by her the whole way through. Mm. Um, the novel structure. Uh, I want to talk about. It's certainly not an uncommon one. You know, an old, an elderly person looks back at their past and mm. realizes that what they think of their memories are not entirely how things may have happened. Mm. 
What is it about this structure that keeps resonating with, with readers and writers? I don't know, but if you, if you do it, you have to do it very, very well. Mm. Otherwise, it just becomes laborious. And the thing I like the best about this is that the moments we were where we were in the present were so small but so vibrant. Mm. And when we went back to the past, it wasn't passive. It was always active, yep. something that was always happening. Mm. Um, I think also she had... She planted things in it, for my mind, like the, the scratch on mm -hmm. her wrist. wrist. Yep. And we didn't find out till the end of the book what the significance of that mm. scratch. And when we found out, you know, it, it was just a, oh, right. And I thought that was endearing. And yeah. that's what kept me going through that yep. book, that she just kept dropping things mm. in along the way until we pieced it all together beautifully. Yep. We knew about Liza and Hilda and Fred from fairly early in, but we didn't piece it all together. Mm. So I think in doing the flashback, if you keep it interesting, yep. keep us emotionally involved mm. and curious, then it's going to work. Mm. If, you, if you don't go back to maudlin terrible and it's obviously informs the moment then it doesn't work but we didn't know till till we nearly got to the end mm. how all these things informed the moment so i just thought it was beautifully done yeah. for that whole as you say not uncommon yep. going back to push the narrative forward mm. Mm. yeah no i think you're right mm. um i want to talk about the end of the book and the the nodding plume of the horse oh. um and it seems like an incredibly profound realisation that she has when she's sort of picturing the nodding plume of the horse. What what do you think is at the core of that realisation for her? That strange, chaotic grief, mm. I thought. I thought there must have been some sort of confusion with gallantry, Lancelot, and that unresolved, unrecognised, oppressed grief that mm. somebody else said oh your grace says your grief was quite excessive mm. and I think at the end of the book and it was in the last two pages mm. wasn't it yeah everything comes out <laughs> everything came out and it was just and the funeral the plume from the mm. yeah that funeral. what she's thinking was always Lancelot's horse is really it's the really funeral horse. the grief of her father and standing there and looking at the buckle buckle and the, mm. the dress and they're so real we've all had we've all got those in our memory those mm. memories of putting your arms up and your yep. mum puts your dress on mm. and yeah. How did it affect you? Did you get watery like me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a very moving piece and it sort of puts together all of the, the pieces of the puzzle. It explains why she went into that whole fantasy landscape, why she needed, like it's not just that she needed an escape and somewhere to put all of her artistic feelings, but it's also the place where she needed to put her grief. And it certainly also helps explain why she sh will shut down whenever there is the beginning of some kind of emotional connection with another human. Yes. That she never really reaches that and all of her friendships like her friendship with olive um mm. you know she's always kind of pushing away at mm. those kind of all of those peripheral characters and certainly uh with grace as well and sort mm. of the more i've still been thinking about grace as we've been talking and i feel like they are in some ways incredibly similar mm. um and they're both angry and they're both frustrated uh, but they are reacting to that in different ways i would have liked to have known it, it, we don't know grace married Peter Chitty or mm. someone and yeah. we didn't really get to know much about her no. except the point that she had always wanted faith but yeah. only had so they've just kind of all lived a disappointed mm. life. I feel like Grace kind of managed to get it together at the end though in because end. she found her gardening and she found yes. you know solace in in growth and in life and you know the idea of gardening is a very healthy and yeah. um, and you know kind of natural and productive sort of hobby that you know that grows things um, as opposed to what I think she thought that faith was mm -hmm. which is probably not what. Do you think faith do you think her faith was lost with the death of Dorothy rainbow maybe possibly maybe it seems like she didn't at least she wasn't i think she confused faith with piousness um and that those are not the same thing how disappointing would it have been for grace if she'd lived and found out that nora hadn't read her letters about dorothy rainbow yeah very and, and we we've got to think about grace living through that mm. because because dorothy was her friend yeah and I do feel like there are moments like with those letters where where Grace is reaching out to Nora yeah, and Nora, Nora just won't let her in in no. that pattern that she's already established. She must have tried. Mm. Mm. Um, 
So at the end of the novel, Nora talks about the, the real river that she's found, that she sort of feels like there's this been whole this whole river that she imagined, the sort of the Lady of Shalott River, and that in fact there was this river that was right there all along. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is almost a kind of like a Wizard of Ozzy kind of moment of of realizing that um, you know that what you were looking for is in your own backyard. Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think she didn't see and what do you think it is that she now does see? Well, she didn't see the river. She walked along it and she says, I, I never noticed it. She walked up and down it mm. for so long. What she sees, because she goes for that walk and she can't get to it, mm. but she knows that it is there. I think that the river is probably inevitability mm. somehow and that what she was looking for always was there. Mm. She just hadn't seen it. Mm. In the same way, getting back to talking about structure, in the same way that those photographs she looked at her father on two occasions, I knew that they would kick in mm. and we find they did at yep. the end with the plume and mm. I think the river does the same thing. Yep. She suddenly mm. realises it. Yeah, a trigger for the sort of the last pieces of the puzzle in some yes, ways. Yeah, and that whole novel was just a journey to find out all of those things. It was a lovely journey. Mm. Um, do you think that David is right when he tells Nora that she's homeless on Earth? Yes, I think he's quite right. Um, at the time, I think he is quite right, but I, she does confess to it in the end that mm. she, she was right to come home. Yeah. It was good to come home. Yeah. Um, a part of that was, of course, confronting the dark side of the globe, mm. um, but denying all her, those emotions and all of those things that she didn't see coming home and finding those, mm. I think she found home and I think she was probably quite happy with herself in the end. Mm. Looking at that tapestry and seeing how beautiful it was and understanding that it was always there, the river, the inevitability of it. Yeah, I think he was right at the time, but I think in the end mm. she did find home and she did find herself. Yeah. I wonder if there is sort of any truth in the cliche of, you know, home is, is people. Um, and, you know, home is, is wherever the people you love are. That's where your home is. And in some ways she doesn't have that. No, she doesn't. But I also think that um, home is landscape. Mm -hmm. I really do believe that because um, one, that's one of the things I identified most with, that landscape for her and walking across it. Because your landscape, when you're born and raised, is where the furniture is, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's where it's all created. Yeah. It's what you see and how you see it and what it means. Your sense of distance, your sense of direction, all mm -hmm. those things are placed when yeah. you are a kid. And I can say this because I was born and raised in a small country town and my family is still there. Mm -hmm. And when I go home, I'm just completely put back into... Yeah order again yeah. everything is put into perspective yeah. and everything becomes a starting point again and I go forth into the world mm -hmm. so it sort of orient orientates me and I think that probably the landscape because it's so subtle but predominant in that book I think that's what happens to yeah um Nora as well even if she doesn't she sets out to return the tapestry she doesn't find the house mm. it's all changed yeah but when she turns the corner and sees her house again I think that it all falls into place for her yeah there. and I think there is also there's a, a passage where she goes uh and sees Betty and and talks about how everything has changed and I actually think the book is is in some way saying that that change is a good thing because they're talking about how they used to try and sort of replicate these English cottage gardens and grow all of these sort of very sort of European plants but now now everyone is growing more tropical, native things. And, and Betty says, oh, you know, even we do that now. Mm. Um, and I think that there is this very nice sense that the land has sort of, it's that people have stopped trying to resist the land and are starting to just become yes. part of it. And they're not colonists or settlers anymore, that no. they belong here now and that they're being accepted by the land and, and the sort of the native flora. Mm. Mm. Um, I and so. I think that that's something that she has to do as well. Mm -hmm. It's sort of... Um, yeah, stop resisting her environment. Uh, and also when she opens the door mm. and sees her bed there, which is the past, mm. and it's a shocking thing for her, yeah. but she confronts it yep. and she has to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, it's all coming together for me now <laughs> as I'm talking about it. Yeah, as in the same way that people now plant... They're not resisting... They are not looking back to the old country yeah. anymore. Yeah. yeah. That's, 
Um, well, we might turn the discussion over to you guys. Does anyone have any questions or comments or thoughts or anything at all? Yep. Unfortunately, I haven't read the book. Oh, sorry, we, I, we may have spoiled the ending for you a little bit. And I just wondered if you can just give us some sort of a brief overview of what the book is all about. I certainly want to read the book mm -hmm. after you've been discussing it. It's, a, it's many things. It's a lot of things in there now, and I can't really say. It's a, it sounds simplistic to say it's about an elderly woman who's reflecting a, upon her life. It's so much more than that. It's about landscape. It's about the way memory plays with you. It's about the search for identity. It's about the difference between being an artist and not being an artist. It's about the time. It's about Sydney at the time. It's about London at the time. Mm -hmm. It's and definitely about women. Women. Yeah. Yes. You know, the fact that she didn't have sex anymore, mm. I think, um, sort of reflected the whole issue for women about birth control. Yep. And the lack of it. Yep. Um, and the way she describes it in the abortion, mm -hmm. um, the hot spot. Yep. And it was so. Brutal. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. horrible. Yeah, it was such a brutal sort of thing. Mm. And she thought that having children was the thing that would fulfill her and Colin, but. Then she realised that wasn't mm. it, which must have been very weird yeah. at the time. And also, she was, um, you know, she was just out of place. Mm. Yes. Because her um, mother and her sister were so committed and condemned yeah. to marriage, which was really young. Yeah, and mm. not to mention her mother-in-law, who is, you know, no. the, the sort of living embodiment of every terrible mother-in-law cliche there is. Um, you yeah, know, it was it's just... Sorry, <laughs> you finished now. Um, but yeah, it is. It is a novel about that. Um, it's sort of like a, a reverse coming of age, I suppose. I wonder if there's a sensible German word for that. Um, but it is about a woman's transition from growing up in a, a town in Queensland, which I think is the outskirts of Brisbane. It's not really yeah. quite clear, um, but it certainly feels like a country town. And then she moves to Sydney when she gets married and then moves to London after her divorce and then comes home again. Um, and in a very simplistic way, that's what the story is. But, um, of course, it is much more about a, a journey of self-discovery. And she, it's complicated by the fact that she's got pneumonia at the time, so she's a little bit... She's hallucinating yeah. a little bit, which makes things... And so she, she realises then that she must confront her past. Mm. And, and that's exactly what she does. But it's, it's lovely. It's, it's, it's not, there's no sense that she, I got it wrong. I, no. I, I didn't live my life the right way. It's, she actually comes to terms with the whole thing yeah. and sees the goodness in it. So it's, it's good. Mm. It's all good. Wait, wait, wait. Um, because uh, I do understand how uh, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time, mm. but she's a very prickly personality. Mm. Oh, she's very she? hard to like. Uh, very hard to like. And I was interested when uh, she returned to Australia and she just cut... Uh, she, I think they had exchanged letters for one or two times, and these mm. were people she lived with for a long time. Well, yep. that's finished, and now I'm on to this. Mm. So your comment was interesting about um, intimacies and about ha how you suggested that she cut down a lot of relationships mm. because of the grief, and I hadn't thought about that. So perhaps that's why she's so quick to cut people off. Yeah, she made that decision very quickly to come home, didn't she? Yes. But I, I'm not, I thought that was because that was the most convenient and would be the most compassionate and loving, lovely thing to do for Hilda and Liza. Yeah, I didn't get that well, But that's not consistent with her loving and mm. altruistic, is it? No. <laughs> right. Mm. Okay. I, yeah, I think that she's very, very difficult to like. Um, she certainly, like, you know, sometimes you read books about people and you're like, I would love to have a cup of tea with that person, but you don't want to have a cup of tea with an um, and she is like, and there are also times where she's very frustrating. You want to shake her and you want to say, you know, don't marry that guy, leave him, go and do a thing, you know, put your sleeping pills away, just calm down and be a little bit more rational. And yeah, and she's cause she can be quite sardonic, which I think's amusing. Yeah, and she's she funny and sarcastic yeah. too. Her self hatred also um, is very frustrating, and and yeah. I want to mm. call her a silly sausage and tell her to buck up a little bit. But, mm. yeah, she's hard, I think. Yep. I really liked her. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's probably because I'm older mm -hmm. 
and I've seen more of the stuff that she went through. Yeah. Um, can you comment on the globe of memory? Sorry? The globe. Oh, the globe. Um, it was a way... What Do you mean, what was it? It was the way she saw her life. Mm. It was just a, a globe, it's something that she had created. I think Hilda or Liza had a linear structure of, of to look back on their past, whereas hers was a round ball. It was just a formal kind of literary device, really, wasn't mm. it, for to be able to confront certain memories and not. And so she would say, oh, well, I will spin the globe now to the dark side of that globe and I will confront that memory. I don't know if it was a metaphor for the world or the life or anything. I think there's definitely supposed to be some kind of connection between that and the and the Lady of Shalott's mirror. Um, oh, yes. And perhaps some kind of comment on the fact that a mirror is something that's two-dimensional and that a globe is three-dimensional mm. and that it is... So there are, there are parts of it that can be hidden, whereas a mirror will always reflect what's in front of it, whereas with the globe, you can only... And you can never see all of it at the same time. Yes. Mm. Throughout the novel, you feel that she spins. Yeah, she yes. does. Out of she does. control quite often. Yes, yeah. definitely. Mm. Yes. It's quite an ingenious thing. Mm. Um, just, um, just a comment. I find it fascinating that the most interesting books to read for me are ones where cranky old women are looking back on their past yeah. and it's just so interesting. Mm. You know, like, you don't get that, rom that romantic view and yet at the end you get something really rich and fulfilling mm. um, that maybe the romantic view wouldn't have given you anyway. Mm. I, did, I was thinking of your, yours, Rosalie, with... Um, there should be more dancing. Oh, Marjorie. You know, Marjorie. Yes. And yeah. I was thinking of um, the story of Sunday Reed. Um, what was that? Uh, was that book by um, uh, oh, Alex Miller? Oh, um, which Alex Miller is it? It's, it's the one with Sunday, where Sunday Reed and, and Sydney Nolan. It talks about... I can't the, but anyway, one. she is a cranky old bitch mm. and she really does give you such a wonderful, wonderful view. Yeah. of, And you don't like her very often, mm. you know. Like, she's certainly not a lovable person and not one you'd like to have a coffee with. But but you can't deny the richness of the life that mm. she's had. And it sort of goes to show that being nice doesn't necessarily no. give you a really great life. Yeah. You no. know, it, it pays to make people work. Yeah. You know, to have anything to do yeah. with you. I, I, I like... I quite like Nora when she's being grumpy at other people, but I wish she would be less grumpy at herself. I think it, you, you probably... Um, I don't know, I can't speak, but I'm speculating that by the time you've lived quite a few years, you would be less tolerant of people under some circumstances. I Yet, don't think paradoxically, Nora is ever tolerant of people, really. Who, Nora? Nora, yeah. No. But, uh, <laughs> but you, sometimes you think, well, you must get more patient about some things mm. and less patient about others. So I, I was in quite... I quite indulged Nora. I thought yeah. she had a... I quite liked it because she was prickly. Mm. Mm. She's very patient Yeah. I think also she was very perverse. She loved it when things turned out as badly as she'd expected. Yes. <laughs> she did. Yes. <laughs> So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, yeah, the plastic surgery thing. She seems so gleeful yeah. when it goes wrong. And her mother, oh, you girls, you know, and her yeah. arguing with Grace the whole time. It must have been really annoying for Grace. Mm. Poor Grace. Any other thoughts or comments? This one in the middle. Um, I was just wondering your time differences in when you read it between times. I first read it. HSC, mm. and I read it again, what, last year, but that's 20 odd years after HSC, yeah. and it read as a completely different book, yeah. and I suspect that if I read it again in 10 years' time, I'd read it again with my own experiences and that as a completely different book again. Mm. Um, I was just wondering with Rosalie, that you read it three Yes, three times the time gaps between reading it. Mm. And I've had something different. The first time I read it was a very long time ago um, and I can't even really remember what I thought about it then. But the second reading, it, it was in a writer's workshop so we probably pulled it apart in terms of technique. Mm. Uh, but this time I just read it with a 
ear to Nora because I'm a bit closer to her age now and I found it very moving. The pathos was very different and I kept finding different things. Mm. There's so much that's sunk into... It's so subtle and there's so much that it's infused in it and there's so many things in it. I, I adored it. Mm. How many times have you read it? I read it once as a uni student and then once for now. So I've read it twice. And I think I certainly, you know, being all of 10 years older than I was the first time I read it, I certainly identify a lot more with her now yes. as a, you know, mm. as an older married woman. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, so I think it is one of those things which, which makes me, you know, wonder how our Year 12 students are going to connect yes. with it. Um, well, I'll, I'll just have to find a few things. Yeah. Well, I certainly those. think that I feel a lot more connected to adult Nora now, whereas as a younger person, I was very much connected to, um, you know, because as a teenager, you know, I used to live in a fantasy world and I love the Lady of Shalott. And so yes. I had a very strong bond with that Nora. And so I suppose I lived in dread that I would turn out like adult Nora. I loved it also because... Um, being a writer and you as well, mm. you probably saw the techniques, the, like the yeah. reoccurring um, motive of the horse mm-hmm. through it. And yep. I just loved encountering a horse yeah, again. Yeah. It is always lovely to pick yeah. up on those little. Yeah. Mm. Yep. I was just going to say, in terms of uh, younger students, I think it's really valuable when you were talking about the social cultural context yes. of it. Uh, and as you get older, you appreciate the opportunities you've had that you wouldn't have had Absolutely. if you were living back there. All of the things that happened to her mm. could easily have happened to us. Yep. Mm. Um, and so I think it's, a, it's really valuable to share that with younger mm. um, Year 12s who have no sense of what the world was like and maybe look at their parents and their grandparents mm. differently. Yeah, and definitely... Wait, maybe you didn't have the choices we had yeah. or... Yeah. Uh, open that discussion Mm. which can be really valuable just in terms of their relationship yeah and it's very easy to kind of look at it with a modern cynical eye and go oh well why didn't she just leave Colin and go and become an artist with the lovely bohemian people but Mm. I mean obviously that was not an option for her and the fact that he wouldn't even let her have a job or give her money for bus fare to go and visit her friends is you know gosh yeah yeah Yeah, I blame his mother entirely Uh, we've got time for one last question or comment. Uh, I teach in the U3A mm-hmm. and um, I'm setting this up for September, October of this year and I'm looking at um, the Watchtower mm-hmm. as well as this book yep. with the idea that a lot of the people in the U3A are older people mm-hmm. and usually women and we want to just reflect and appreciate the lives that our mothers yep. had. Mm. And uh, this book lends itself beautifully, and yeah. so does the Watchtower. Mm. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a um, it is a beautiful book for being able to see the world, uh, you know, through the lens of other experiences and other times. Mm. And on that note, um, please join me in thanking Rosalie for being with us this thank afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.